Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest this week is retired U.S. Army Major General Mary Kay Eder. She served 36 years in the Army, and while there, she commanded at the company, battalion, brigade, and division levels. She also held some of the most critical communications positions in the Army, and she was also the top official when it came to the U.S. Army Reserve. She is now a sought-after speaker and is the author of multiple books. Her latest is entitled The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, Untold Stories of the Women who changed the course of World War II. And General Eater, thank you very much for being with us. It's great to be here. Thank you. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Grove City, Pennsylvania, which is about 50 miles north of Pittsburgh, and that's where I grew up. Any history of military service in your family? My brother was drafted in Vietnam, and he served for about two years and then left the Army. But I was a very competitive kid, and if he could do it, I could do it. So that was the motivation? That was a motivation. Originally, I mean, I was 15 then, so. You went to uh, Edinburgh University in Pennsylvania, correct? Edinburgh, mm hmm And was that an ROTC uh, opportunity or something different? They didn't have ROTC different? there at that time. It was at other universities in the area. So what I did was achieve a direct commission. At that time, they were commissioning people directly into the Army. They are now into certain specialties like cyber. But at that time, I was commissioned into the Women's Army Corps, Yes, it still existed and was there for about another year after I came in. And so you graduated, I believe, was it 1977? Yes. And you went on active duty. And so where did you go from there? Well, my degree was in English. I wanted to get into journalism in the Army, public relations, public affairs. I didn't know that that was not an entry-level specialty. So what I was given instead was the Army Signal Corps and put into communications electronics. So I went to the basic course as a former English major with about 75 West Point graduates with degrees in engineering. So it was a little over my head. Um, I was still trying to figure out the positive and negative ends of a battery while they were all way ahead of me. So I later transferred to the Military Police Corps um, I was stationed at Fort McClellan, and it wasn't until I was well into my years as a captain and in the reserves that I was able to get into public affairs. And we'll certainly talk about that in more detail in just a moment. Obviously, 40-some uh, years ago, the situation in the Army as, as it relates to women, I'm sure the culture was a little bit different. There weren't as many serving then. Uh, what was your experience as you joined active duty? Well, I think the average has been about 15% of the Army as women. And certainly at the time I came in, it was post-Vietnam. This was the what we call the hollow army. It, there were lots of problems with discipline, with drugs, with anything else you could possibly think of in relation to discipline. So it was a very different time. It wasn't an experience that I found particularly enjoyable, nor was it one that I thought was very supportive. At the lower levels, yes, there are lots of women. There were not role models at higher grades, not that I saw. I did see one woman general uh, when I was a lieutenant, but that was, that was about it. Did you feel that there was opportunities for advancement? I was in the military police battalion at Fort Meade, and at that time I was offered a scholarship to complete my doctorate. I came into the Army with a master's in English. I was offered the opportunity to finish my doctorate, the Army agreed that I could go to take this fully funded opportunity as long as I had done two things. I had to command a company first, and then afterwards I had to serve a tour, a utilization tour, a payback for the time I was gone, and that would have been to teach English at West Point. So the military police battalion I was in, the battalion commander said, women don't command in my unit. So I didn't have the opportunity to do that. So I lost the scholarship, I lost the follow-on opportunity, and that's when I left active duty. But you joined the reserves then. Why did you decide to do that instead of maybe back to civilian life? Well, I did have civilian jobs. I went to Germany and worked for the Army. And at that time, I thought, this isn't, my problem is not with what the Army said to me, it is with my approach to it. So there, there is the, what we call the full frontal assault, going after something head-on. Right. and then running into a wall. So I need to find a way to get to where I want to be, and I need to find a different way in which to do it. So I missed my friends, so I rejoined the Army Reserves, 
And when I came back to the States a couple of years later, I would think I was ready then to be able to move forward past my experiences earlier. So from the reserves, I stayed with the 80th Training Division in Richmond, Virginia. I got a job as a civilian in public affairs at Fort Lee, Virginia, became the public affairs director there, began to teach at the quartermaster school and at the logistics center. I would teach the pre-command courses. I would teach public affairs, media relations. And I enjoyed that, and I really enjoyed being in the reserves. I had such a wonderful time meeting people from all over, all different walks of life. And when you're with people like that, they talk to you in different ways than they would if you met them in their roles as a civilian. So I learned what it was like to be the city prosecutor for Roanoke, Virginia. And my boss would say, this is how I talk to all my attorneys, and it's how I'm going to talk to you. So I had different life experiences almost vicariously by seeing how others worked and what they did. One of the things that I find fascinating, and it's amazing how some people don't realize this, is the educational opportunities that are available on active duty and in the reserves, and obviously some take more advantage of that than others, but you're an example of a tremendous amount of opportunities in education and other training that uh, you've put to good use. There are so many opportunities. There is anything you can think of. And I say to people now, if you're thinking about joining the military, regardless of service, there's something there for everyone, regardless of what you want to do. At Fort Lee, Virginia, the Army's quartermaster school is there, which means food service, which means the cook school, which means visiting chefs. I really wanted to be a dessert judge (laughs) in the annual culinary competition, and that never quite happened, but it was still a tremendous education to see how all of that worked. As they also trained the Navy cooks, a little bit different with shipboard experiences. So I had an education every day just through getting to see and understand how things worked. And that's one of the things public affairs offers you is that opportunity. We'll talk about how you put those skills to use during conflict in a little bit, but uh, how did you use them during peacetime? Well, as I said, I decided I needed to do one thing more than what I was asked to do every day. So I started to volunteer to speak and to teach public relations, media. Um, I was terrified at first, standing up in front of people. That was something I'd never wanted to do or thought I could be good at. But I made myself do it. And it brought me more and more opportunities to go places, to speak at different conferences, different schools. And a few years later, it gave me the opportunity to apply for and be accepted for a job at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Garmisch, Germany. I knew where that was, and I definitely wanted to go. Why? It's a beautiful area. The mission itself of this place is incredible. There are several of these centers founded by DOD after the fall of the wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The purpose of the Marshall Center and the one in Hawaii, in the Pacific, and the one that's in D.C. for Southwest Asia and for the Interdefense College looking towards South America is to teach the principles of democracy to officials from various countries. So I got to teach the role of a free press in a democracy to senior defense officials from over 35 countries. That is not something you can duplicate anywhere. Let's talk a little bit about your public relations career during conflict. Like I mentioned, um, you served with the U.S. European Command in Stuttgart, Germany. And while there, you headed up media relations during NATO operations in Kosovo and later in Afghanistan. What are the top priorities in that environment? What do you most want to convey to the media? And what does the media most want from you during times like that? During times like this, the media don't know where to go. Do I talk to someone at the Department of Defense? Do I talk to someone at the European Command? So they don't know the structure to know that, initially at least, the forces in Afghanistan are related to what is at the European Command. So we had the responsibilities for discussing some of the wounded who came back and went to launch to a hospital, uh, talking about some of the forces deployed that came out of Europe. Same for Kosovo, although that was more of a an air war. So it was more of a 
let's explain how this works. Let me tell you what I can. Let me give you other resources and places to go. So we would speak not only to the American press, but also to the European press and to even the German press. So we had German civilians who worked in our office who could do some of that much better than I on camera. Uh, I think folks who remember back to the early days following 9-11 can remember some of the sparring in the Pentagon press room between members of the media and secretary at the time, Don Rumsfeld, about uh, what can be divulged and what can't be. So most often the press is going to want to know things that uh, command doesn't necessarily want divulged. So how do you balance that responsibility in both directions? There are some press briefings that are given off the record where you explain how things work, such as base realignment and closure. Today we're going to talk about how the process works, so later when you ask me questions, you'll know why. I can tell you certain things or I can't. So there are some of those types of briefings they do in the Pentagon. We did some of those from the European Command that explained if a certain soldier happens to become injured here, we can divulge the results of that to you, to the family. If they are injured while deployed forward, that comes from the Pentagon. That is the Pentagon's rules. It's not ours. This is how it works. We'll give you the phone numbers. You can call them because we can't. So then they understand the process. And I think it's helpful to know this is how it works so that they're not frustrated. And again, with that coming into a door that is locked or is just a solid wall in front of you and not knowing how things work, it can be helpful. Do you have a good relationship with the press, by and large? By and large. I think I had a great learning experience with many of them. Certainly the most difficult interview I ever did there was with the BBC. Well, that was because it, when it's one reporter and you, you can, and you know them and you've dealt with them before, you know how to present the information and you know typically what you'll be asked. So with the BBC, then this was for a show they have called Hard Talk, which is, we would call it hardball, because it definitely is. And so I'd speak to the reporter. The producer is here also. And the producer would say, let's, let's take a break, come over and say, you didn't ask this, this, and this. You need to go back and... So it would make it more difficult, more probing, as he tried to get to the things they apparently had agreed on earlier. So it was a, a, a rich experience. That's a good way to put it, I think. Uh, General Eater, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with much more of your story, and we'll talk about your book uh, okay. in just a little bit here on Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined in studio this week by retired U.S. Army Major General Mary Kay Eater. She served 36 years in the U.S. Army, commanding at every level from company to division. Uh, she held critical communications positions, and in just a moment we'll be talking about her position very high up in the U.S. Army Reserves, and we'll also be talking later about her book, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, about some of the heroines of World War II. And, uh, General, let's uh, talk about... Um, how you rose up the, the chain of command to become the Deputy Commanding General of the, the Joint Reserve. Um, how did those opportunities present themselves after all that work you had done in public relations? Well, I came back from Germany in 2002, about six months after 9-11, so it was quite a tumultuous time here. As a civilian, I was at the Transportation Security Administration as the Deputy Director of Public Affairs. The director was a political position. It was a very uh, chaotic time at this new agency. This is before DHS. So TSA was everything as far as airports, airport security. I had a phone. I had a pager. It was constant on call. Um, <clears throat> I had an office that was supposed to have 42 people. I had four. So it can give you an idea of how difficult that was. Then I was recalled to active duty again and went to work at OSD, uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, working for the Reserve Forces Policy Board, which oversees policy for employing Reserve Forces, all, all of the services. And it was a great experience also. Talk a little bit about the, the role of that board and how they advise the Secretary and the rest of the staff. The board is comprised of 24 general officers from all services. And so I was the chief of staff there. So I helped the staff support them in their meetings, in their preparation of reports, going to the Secretary of, through the Secretary of Defense to Congress. It's an annual requirement. How would you describe 
once, I guess, the shock wore off, but obviously major priorities immediately facing everyone. Um, did, did, did the brass uh, and, and the civilian leadership uh, dig in as, as you would have expected them to? Was there this chaos that you mentioned that it, that it persist for long? How would you describe how quickly the adaptation happened there? When I first came into the reserves, one of the things I noticed in all of my commands, even when I worked at Fort Lee, Virginia, was how much of the structure is still reflective of World War II. The stru- entire structure that makes for an Army fort is basically what an Army division was in World War II. It's changed through the years, but that was how it started. And my reserve unit in ni- the 1980s, I had a mess hall, a kitchen, and cooks, and all of the equipment they had said 1942 on it. So there were still a lot of things that, including policies, that seemed to have been in place for 40-some years at least. And so at the beginning of a very different type of conflict um, in terms of what at first was Operation Enduring Freedom Afghanistan and then later Iraqi Freedom in Iraq, we got to see the issues with all of those old policies that had never been revised, reviewed, left untouched that began to bubble up primarily in terms of orders. So if we're going to put you on orders from your reserve unit or guard to active duty, it's which kind do we use? And there were at least, and I probably have this wrong, at least 45, 50, maybe up to 80 different types of orders. So the to the active duty, this is just mind-boggling. Can't we just get them in here? Why, Why can't we do this easily? So there's still some work to be done on this. So it's taken you, quite a while. Were you reforming on the fly or trying to make the old system fit, in, fit the square peg into the round hole, or how did that work? Initially, it was making the old system work, and then as time went on, it was, we don't, do we really need this type of orders? Let's get rid of that. We can combine it with this one. Then we have to rewrite this. It's, it's a big ball of string, and you have to, when you pull on one little bit of the string, you know, lots of things unravel, and you find them and see how they worked or didn't work through the years. Well, post 9-11, obviously a lot was asked of our reservists, and you were soon in a position to be helping formulate what the policy would be. What are the the critical priorities in using reserves well and also not overtaxing them? There is still a great deal of debate about this, as I'm sure you're aware. It is not two weeks a year and once one weekend a month. So if we're going to use reserve forces more often, and this is talking from the policy level, we have to make certain they're ready to go, ready and trained, and that means spending more time than those two weeks often enough. So certainly there has to be a revision of understanding with reservist employers as to how reserve forces are used. How much training do we do in a year? Is all of it necessary? Do we really need to do all of these annual briefings until your mind is numb. Can we do them in some other way and still find a way to pay you for doing them, even if it's at home and we do this uh, through video? That that has taken quite a while to come to that point. But certainly at first it was how much more do we need to do and how quickly can we do it? So you see centers pop up that do pre-deployment training. So soldiers would go there for 30 days or so, finish off all of that training, be certified, do the dental exams, the physical exam, the fitness test, wills, all of that. That happened to me in Germany when I was first recalled, and the European command was not ready for reservists. I had been there for, what, three years by then, but they were not ready to process me into an active status. So they went, hmm, well, the 10th Special Forces Group is over here doing a readiness preparation day before they're sent somewhere, you can go over there. What was I thinking? I didn't have a shot record. I was in line. I got every shot the Special Forces guys were getting that day. It was probably about 15 of them, so I can go anywhere in the world now. I'm ready. (laughs) Nobody's going to travel ban you. Uh, So with the the realization of what the reservists need to do to be ready, how would you characterize how ready they were then, uh, whether it was Iraq or Afghanistan, and as time went on during those wars? The forces that we had then were 
not only ready, but they were motivated. They were motivated to do the mission they were given and to show and to prove that they were, they were good for it, that they were ready to do what job they were given. And so as we're now, for the most part, out of Iraq, and as we're speaking now in the summer of 2021, we're about to leave Afghanistan, how would you characterize where the reserves stand right now? Are they in a much better place to respond if the national security threat arises, or are there still major changes that need to be made? I think for all of our forces, there is a constant state of transition now. As I departed active service, one part of my command was dealing with information operations and cyber forces and how we were going to build those, build structure, have the Army reserve piece of cyber and I.O. units coordinate with those in other services, how they were standing up their organizations, how all of that worked. It's still a work in progress. There is the U.S. Cyber Command now. There is where the Army Cyber Center is now. And it's still, it's still working. But we have tremendous expertise in the reserve forces, of course, because these people do it every day. We, we could talk about what I did in that command was have the units under me that have highly technical specialties, including I had 1,875 attorneys. And I mention that because if you want to have a trial attorney in the active army, during a 20-year career, they might have prosecuted two, maybe four cases. An Army Reserve trial attorney might have done hundreds. So there is an experience difference that perhaps sometimes we don't realize because of doing certain tasks over and over, whereas in the active Army, you're much more of a generalist than perhaps you are for some things in the reserves. General, let's pause again. We'll be right back with much more with retired U.S. Army Major General Mary Kay Eater, and we'll also be talking about her book, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line. We'll be right back. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by retired U.S. Army Major General Mary Kay Eater. We've been talking about her service uh, to the U.S. Army that lasted 36 years in communications, uh, in uh, holding a very high uh, position in commanding the reserves. We're also going to be getting her thoughts on uh, the cyber challenges facing the United States in terms of national security. And we'll spend the bulk of the rest of our conversation talking about her new book, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, Untold Stories of the Women Who Changed the Course of World War II, and I cannot recommend the book highly enough. The stories uh, in in The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line will absolutely keep you amazed. Uh, uh, General Eater, as um, you rose through the ranks, you obviously uh, could, I'm sure, see major changes from when you first joined back in the 1970s. Now that you were in a position to implement, or at least advocate for a great amount of change. Um, what did you focus on um, as it pertained to, to women and also to the reserves? One of the things I have always kept in mind as I progressed beyond the level of colonel, and frankly that was my goal, was to get to colonel. Anything beyond that, I had no concept that it could or would occur. But when it did, my focus was how will this matter to the people at ground level? What does this do for them? And when will they see a result from this? If you change a policy up here, it's like rain on the roof, and by the time it comes out through the downspout, what do they see but a drop? So how do we make this relevant to the people on the ground level? So that's, that's what my advocacy was for, and as a general officer, it was why I wanted to stay, was to make that difference. It, it's been said by some, and you may agree with this, that... Uh, the more some folks advance up the chain of command, they are perceived to lose touch with those who are actually on the ground. What did you do to try to make sure that that did not happen and that what you were advocating for was actually relevant to the people who would be doing the fighting? Well, I think one of the things you do is maintain your contacts. So I never lost contact with the people at the 80th Division I'd been in in Richmond, and I would visit there. I would talk to people from all levels, even when I was in the Pentagon, I would wander the halls and just talk to people. What do you think? What do you see? Oh, by the way, I know so-and-so. Maybe I could ask them to come in here as a reservist and do some time here. So I eventually, at Army Public Affairs, got about 10 more people to augment the staff there because the workload was incredible, uh, not just with the media but with 
other programs we had started to maintain better and more contact with the American people. Because as the Army has changed through the years, you see that there are fewer units in hometowns. So I travel through an airport wearing a uniform, and people don't see anybody in uniform anymore. It's not in their area. You may see National Guard, and the Guard will tell you we're in every town. But that doesn't seem to be true for a lot of people to recognize soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, now that Space Force, they don't see it. I can't tell you how many times I've been offered, I'd like to buy you a drink in the airport, which if I'm in uniform, I can't have it. <laughs> so it's very interesting to see what people's views of the military are, because they'll tell you. Um, they'll tell you what they think or what how they think things work. I was in outside of Columbia, Columbus, Georgia, in the airport for, near Fort Benning. And this older gentleman came up to me with his wife and said, I want to talk to you about our son. He's here in basic training. Actually, he just finished basic training, and they're taking him in this other school, and they're making him do another test. Why are they making him do another test? He doesn't need one. I said, you're absolutely right. He does not. But because they have so many people coming in, what makes sense to them to do is just test everybody, and then we have a basic level where everybody starts from. He said, oh, okay. So there are things that don't make sense to people that you have to understand it's the way it looks to them and how we need to explain things better. And that was one of the things I tried to do. And it all goes back to communications. It's not just formal presentations uh, to colleagues or the media. It's actually articulating the policy right down to the family level and, and making a difference. Because you have to say, be able to say, explain to your mother what you do in the Army. And I would say that to people all the time. Can you tell your mother what you do? And they would be, no, I just tell her I do stuff. <laughs> well, let's see if we Some can find a way. Some prefer it that yeah. way. I don't know. Let's see if we can find a way to help you explain it. Before the break, we were also talking about your work uh, on the cyber side of things. You wrote a book uh, that uh, came out in the last few months called American Cyberscape. And uh, I, I believe Americans are pretty well aware of uh, the threats that we face. It was a few years ago we had uh, the hack of, of OPM and then recently solar winds, and uh, there are cyber espionage threats happening all the time for our military. So how do we play defense? How do we play offense most effectively in those areas? Well, I think overall it's not just our military in responding to these threats, but it's also American business and individuals beyond government. So for Americans as a whole, we're, we're naive as people. We do not want to think that we have to be so protective of our privacy every moment, but we do. Um, for example, recently, here's a picture of my COVID vaccination card. I'm going to put it on Facebook. So now they're for sale. Fake ones are now for sale in various sites because they were able to cobble together, they meaning hackers, and, and hacking and ransomware, any of this, it's big business, and it's very successful. So it's very easy to create fake ones and sell them, or it's very easy to get into someone's account and take their money, especially older people. So, and let's see, younger people are not immune to this either, because it's every, it's every click, it's every game, it's everything you look at online. No, we are the product that Facebook, some of these other organizations and sites use. We are the product they are selling because of what we do. So yes, there are those 40-page um, documents now. Do you agree to our new terms of service? And most of us don't read them. We just go, yes, let me get to what I want to go look at. But there's a cost to it. So I think we're going to see increased regulation. We're going to see more issues with antitrust. We're going to see, unfortunately, more media mergers and creation of giant media companies. There have been two of them in the past several weeks. So I'm not a ones and zeros cyber kind of person. I'm the, here's the communications atmosphere around it. And that's what I talk about. Are we ahead of our rivals? Are we playing from behind in some ways? How would you describe where we are in the international landscape on cyber right now? In the international landscape, we have to understand that if we create a hierarchy to respond to hackers, trolls, etc., if we create a bureaucracy, we cannot respond in a timely manner. 
because when you, your adversary in the cyber domain has no rules and no requirements, you can't effectively respond to that unless you do it in the same type of a manner. Or you have a defense that is unbreakable. And I think we're going to continue to see the need for better defenses than what we have now. Because when a lot of the social media began, it was the Wild West. Yay, look, we have this. Like, like, like. And then it went downhill from there. So that's what we need to see change. You've been very busy writing. In addition to American Cyberscape, you have a brand new book uh, due out August uh, 2021. And I see it right there. The girls who uh, stepped out of line. The subhead is untold stories of the women who changed the course of World War II. um, For the most part, these are standalone stories, although some uh, figures you mentioned show up in in the other uh, ladies' stories. But from uh, OSS, Office of Strategic Services, to uh, the WACs and the WASPs and the WAVES and um, underground uh, resistance uh, folks uh, in, in Europe and so forth. Fascinating stories. Uh, many of them Americans, some of them Europeans who later became Americans and some who didn't. Um, what motivated you uh, more than anything to write this book? It's kind of an odd story. Uh, several years ago, I was asked to speak at the AUSA Annual Symposium, Association of the U.S. Army. I was a substitute speaker. The original speaker had, uh, had to drop out, and I was asked to talk about leadership and leadership examples. And at that time, I had just read two articles. One was about Virginia Hall, the acclaimed spy from World War II, and the only American woman to receive the Distinguished Service Cross, one step below the Medal of Honor, for courage and bravery in combat during World War II, a civilian with one leg. Amazing. So I had read that story, and I had read another one about Stephanie Check Radar, who had been a spy with the OSS. Actually, it was her obituary. So that's what I used for my talk. And I put them away, although I still thought about those stories and still thought I needed to do something with them. So we'll fast forward to 2019, and I'm watching the Emmy Awards, and Alex Borstein is receiving the award for Best Supporting Actress for Mrs. Mizell. And when she stood up to take the Emmy, she said, In World War II, my grandmother was about to be shot into a pit. She turned to the guard and said, what happens if I step out of line? And he said, well, I won't shoot you, but somebody probably will. So she stepped out of line. And for that, I am here today. And for that, my children are here today. So step out of line, ladies. Step out of line. And I thought, that is what's been nagging at me with these stories. I want to write about them because they're about people who took risks when they didn't have to, when they didn't have, some of them didn't have a choice, but they could have accepted a negative fate, just as her grandmother could have stayed in that line and been shot and killed, and that would have been it. But she decided to fight. So I began to find, sadly, more obituaries as the greatest generation is passing from this earth, and I began to see the connections between some of these people And so I started to put it together. So my agent said, this is a great book. And I said, really? Good. So by February, I had a contract, February of 2020. And we would like to have your entire manuscript by the 1st of May. Oh, I had written one chapter. So I was pretty busy for the next few months. (laughs) I bet, I bet. Um, And I I, I will say that not only is reading these stories absolutely captivating, but your writing uh, draws the reader in very much as well. And I'm sure there's, uh, to to make that many stories, there's about 15 of them, I think, uh, to to make them all fit into one volume. I'm sure there's uh, things that you had to leave out, which was probably difficult. But uh, just some of the things that you read about in this book are amazing. Um, And and as you talk about uh, in the book, courage is not the absence of fear, it's doing it anyway. And so fascinating stories. You mentioned uh, the spy with one leg who accidentally shot herself in the foot crawling through a barbed wire fence and then taught herself to shuffle around like an old woman so she wouldn't get spotted. Um, One that uh, stuck out to me was the uh, morale operations over in China. They somehow intercepted Japanese soldiers' mail back home, and they rewrote the postcards to, uh, to deflate morale uh, back home. It's just, 
in, in addition to all the combat troops that are out there, there's all these other operations that were part of this just absolute unified effort to, to win in Europe and, and in the Pacific. I think, too, that none of what I am writing about takes anything away from the tremendous courage of all of the other people we've read about and their stories from that time. But I don't think the whole story of those years is complete without having the rest of these. And certainly many of the people I wrote about never sought recognition, didn't talk about it, never even told their kids what they did in the war. Did you tell your husband? No, he never asked. No, I didn't tell him. So they didn't, they didn't think about it. So in their later years, as they began to be recognized, most of them were surprised. Now, Charity Adams, who commanded the 6888, was incredible. And when I read her book, most of them wrote biographies, some in 1946, 1947, long out of print. I found a lot of them through different libraries. And you mentioned uh, Kate, I'm sorry, Betty McIntosh, who was the morale operations officer. She, too, wrote her own biography in 1946. If she tried to write that now, I'm sure the CIA would say, oh, no, no, you're not going to publish that because she's very detailed about their training and their operations and how they did things. And so it seems like there's twin purposes here. One is to make sure the full history, as much as you can, of World War II is known, and also um, how at that time a lot of these women were told by the military, no, we just don't have a, a space for you or some other excuse. And they were so committed to the cause and the, the idea that they could do the job is they found a way to serve, whether it was in uniform or some other way. Or they started when they were very young, and uh, some of them who were resistance fighters might have been 17 or 18, and perhaps they didn't quite know what all of this would mean until they, it was a lark at first. Let's sing in the club and pal around with a group of buddies, and and after we all go, as we all go home from the club, we're going to steal the weapons from some, some Nazis if they left them on their bicycles or let the air out of the tires of their truck. And then, and then it became more serious from there. And so by the time they were smuggling Jewish children and whole families out of the country, it was deadly serious. Amazing. We're going to talk more about this uh, in just a moment. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. We're speaking with retired U.S. Army Major General Mary Kay Eater, and the book is The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. We're joined today in studio by retired U.S. Army Major General Mary Kay Eater. She is the author of The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line. We've been talking about this book now for the past several minutes, and um, this is probably an unfair question, but do you have a favorite uh, of these uh, 15 stories of the women who uh, helped to save the Allies and uh, to rescue uh, people in trouble in World War II? I have a different favorite every day, and... Uh, as I was writing them, each one that I was working on was my favorite, and certainly they have all taught me things, too. I had a greater appreciation for the challenges of my own career through learning about what they went through, and I think seeing their persistence and their ability to handle major challenges was a real, real leadership lesson for me just in reading those. And I don't know, you can read this book just for the, the history of it. And in fact, I think I had a couple of reviews already I've seen that said, well, the last part of the book that talks about their legacy into today, that seemed like an agenda. Well, it is, because they did have a definite effect on where we are. They built the path. Maybe right after the war, that path wasn't followed, as everyone tried to return to normal. Uh, with nine million men coming home, who were in uniform, and about half a million women. That was a big move to get all of these people out of Europe and from the Pacific back home and restarted in normal life. So it, it presented its own challenges, but they have had a definite effect on every generation. From Alice Marble, the tennis star, who coached Billie Jean King, who coached Serena Williams, who has helped Coco Goff. You know, they, they have touched every generation going forward, and that lesson, realizing it, I think, kind of blew me away. The Alice Marble story stuck with me. It's the first one, and, it, and, and right out of the gate, it's just how many horrible things can happen to this person, 
and she just keeps her head down and keeps plowing ahead. It's just an, not only an inspirational story, but a great explanation of what to do in a time of crisis or, or great disappointment. And uh, so she goes from losing her either fiancé or husband, uh, losing her baby, and the next thing you know, she's uh, trying to steal uh, Nazi documents in Switzerland. While helping write Wonder Woman comics. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, in, and after the war, then helping to desegregate professional tennis it was incredible. Yes, and obviously one of the great tennis players, certainly of her era, if not of all time. Um, and I'd never heard of her. That's what surprised me. I'd never heard of her starting this. Maybe if you're a tennis player, you would, but I did not. The name rang a faint bell because I do follow tennis, but uh, she's certainly not uh, one of the ones uh, you, re you remember uh, just for their tennis, but uh, she will certainly be on the top of... Uh, uh, people who read this book. Um, you, you talked about the legacy. Um, what do you want people most of all to take away from the book? What I want people to take from this book is an understanding of there are bigger challenges for you in your life. There are things you can do. You're not, I'm not telling you to look at what they did and saying you can do the same thing. It is not about the job. It's about the attitude, and it's about the ability. Not all of them were greatly successful or, or perfect at everything they did, but in looking at what they did and at a time in which they were expected to do absolutely nothing or they were not expected to succeed and they sometimes were not helped by the culture or even dismissed by it or derailed, there are still ways in which to be truly successful and in tune with your own abilities to make a difference. Obviously, as we talked before, a lot has changed from the time where you joined the service to where we are now. How much credit do you give the ladies of World War II for advancing things to the point where you joined the service 30 years later, roughly? <clears throat> well, uh, certainly this year, on June 12th, there will be a recognition of w women veterans. June 12th being Women Veterans Recognition Day harks back to the acceptance in 1948 of women in the services as a permanent fixture because the WAVES were a temporary organization. So was the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in World War II, which later became the WAC. So making them a permanent part of the armed services was definitely a result of what these women did and what they accomplished. And because of not only the Tuskegee Airmen, <clears throat> but the women who were in the 6888, the all-African-American, all-woman postal unit, what they did also helped towards the desegregation of the armed services. And we have honored some of the members, the surviving members of, this, of the 6888. Uh, I remember talking to a lady named Dolores Rudock. I don't know if you've met her yet, but she is an unforgettable person once you've actually uh, spoken with her, a spitfire and, and just uh, an incredible representation of, of that group. Uh, just about out of time, General Eater, uh, what's the next project, or are you giving your typing fingers a little bit of a break here? Oh, there is no break. <clears throat> I think what I want to do next is talk about a friend of mine whose grandmother was the first woman cop in New York City in the 1920s. It's a great story. It's amazing. So that's all I need is a great story, and it's amazing, and then I want to go to it. There you go. And uh, we'll look forward to that one as well. But the uh, book that uh, came out a few months ago is American Cyberscape, and the one uh, that is coming out this summer here, 2021, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, Untold Stories of the Women Who Changed the Course of World War II. General, great pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It comes out August 3rd. August 3rd, 2021. There you go. Uh, retired U.S. Army Major General Mary Kay Eater, 36 years in uniform. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, where at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.